Good morning, everybody. Uh, last week, I made a video about the Lucy Letby case, and I've been looking into it a bit more over the week, as well as many other things that I'm doing. And the more I look into it, the more um, anomalies and strange things I see about the case, and the more I have concerns that this is a serious miscarriage of justice. Now, I'm not 100% saying that is the case, but I'm just saying that when I look at it, I think the probability that this is the case is increasing, and it seems to be happening to other people who are looking into the case as well. Now, look, as I said, if she had done this, um, if she has done these things and she is guilty of the things that she's been found guilty of, yes, she deserves to be in prison for the rest of her life, but I'm not convinced that is the case. And I want to just put forward um, the things that I've looked into and um, the the things that I think are very strange about this whole situation. The thing is that this has been presented by the mainstream media to the public now for two weeks. It, it hasn't stopped since the verdict and the sentencing. The, the media has presented story after story after story. It's still going on. And this is something that it looks like will just stay in the front of the media's preoccupation for months, if not years, there's going to be a statutory inquiry into this. So this is going to keep this in the public spotlight, um, you know, which is unusual because there are 800 to 1,000 homicides every year in the UK. Now, the vast majority of them you don't even hear about at all. They just, you know, there's too many for the media to cover, especially the national media. But this one, obviously, it, it is a very disturbing case. The, you know, as as has been presented to us, uh, we're told that um, seven babies died in the Countess of Chester Hospital in a 12 to 15 month period. And Lucy Letby was present at all of them. And therefore, she's responsible. But that is not true. There were 17 uh, babies that died, 15 at the hospital and two who had um, a health collapse at the hospital and then were transferred to other hospitals and died in another hospital. So there were 17 deaths linked to the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital within that 15 month period that the police were investigating from March 2015 to June 2016. Um, so Lucy Letby was present at eight of them. Uh, nine of them, she wasn't uh, anywhere near the babies. And certainly there was absolutely no connection between her and over 50% of the deaths uh, that happened that were being investigated. So that's the first deception that we're being told uh, by the mainstream media. Now, again, I also have to ask, you know, do you trust the mainstream media to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth all the time? If anyone's learned anything over the last three years from the whole lockdown period, you must realise that they don't tell the truth uh, all the time. And in fact, sometimes they tell blatant lies and they deceive you uh, completely and invert reality. Do you trust the police? to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth all the time? And do you trust the courts never to make a mistake and never to um, be responsible for a miscarriage of justice? Well, you know, simple facts tell you that is not the case. I mean, the very week before um, the verdict was read out in the Lucy Letby case, there was the case of Andrew Malkin, who was released after 17 years in prison after he had been falsely uh, accused and found guilty of rape. Uh, 17 years of his life ruined and taken away because of a miscarriage of justice. When I was in the London Assembly, there was the very um, well-publicised case of Liam Allen, um, a 21-year-old man who was a student whose life was ruined for two years as he was dragged through the courts um, on 12 charges of rape and sexual assault. But the police had the evidence in their possession which would have exonerated him and immediately released him from the process. But they sat on it for years, two years 
because they wanted to convict this person that even though they had the evidence that he was not guilty, they were still bringing a charge against him. That was the Metropolitan Police and that was back in 2017. Those are just two incidences of miscarriages of justice, one where the police knew someone was innocent, but they still went ahead and pressed charges anyway. And the more I look at this case, the more I wonder whether this is the case with Lucy Letby. Again, as I'm there, I'm not 100% certain, but I think there are serious questions to be asked. And again, we have a situation where the media is smearing, jumping on anyone who questions the verdict or the official narrative and either tries to silence them or ridicule them or mock them or saying you're a conspiracy theorist or you're an internet sleuth. You don't know anything. You weren't there. No, I wasn't at the, the case, but I do have a background in science and I'm reading up extensively about it, as are many other people. And there are some very, very good <coughs> um, resources you can look at, which will... Um, really question uh, what was going on. One is uh, a site, Science on Trial. I think the um, the website is rexlucyletby2023.co.uk. I think it's .co.uk. Anyway, I'll look it up and put that in the the um, the uh, notes at the bottom of this video, so you can have a look for yourself. That so. Let's look at various things about the case in more detail than I went into last week. Um, the background to the case is that these 17 deaths um, and numerous more um, health crashes and collapses happened at the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital. And there was a spike in unexplained deaths uh, between uh, the spring of 2015 and summer of 2016. And, and we're told that this coincided with when Lucy Letby was working there. That's not true, because she actually started working there in January 2012. And uh, there were two to three to deaths on average a year uh, for the whole period that she was working there. And even afterwards, it went down in 2017, but uh, came up to that level again in 2018, 2019. But there was a spike in 2015 and 2016. What you're not told is that the unit was upgraded before that spike in unexplained deaths happened so that they were taking many, many more premature uh, babies who needed intensive neonatal care from other hospitals. And immediately after the spike, when Lucy Letby stopped working there in June 2016, the unit was downgraded again so that they were taking fewer babies and uh, not so many babies that needed the intensive care um, for, for premature babies. That was coincided with that unexplained spike in deaths, but that would explain it. They're taking more babies, the death rate goes up, they're taking fewer babies, the death rate goes down. On top of which, there was a report by the RCPCH, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, published in December 2016, which painted a picture of complete chaos in the unit during that period where it had been upgraded to take more babies with needing intensive care because there weren't enough nurses on duty. There just simply were not enough staff to cope with the extra influx of babies. So, of course, there was chaos in the unit. Things were going wrong all over the place because it was just you know, uh, there was not enough staff to cope with it because they were getting more and more work to do, which they couldn't cope with. And there weren't um, being placing, you know, there was no, or, or not enough extra staff to cope with the extra babies, which again is, a, a, a pro, you know, that would almost entirely explain why there was um, a spike in unexplained deaths or deaths of babies during that period. And the report said as much, and it pointed the finger 
at the consultants um, who, who hadn't got a grip of it. Um, now, the case itself, when it went through court, has some very strange things about it. Now, originally, the police wanted to bring eight charges of um, murder uh, for the deaths of eight of those 17 babies. But just before the case, the judge directed the police, or the prosecution, actually, um, to drop one of the charges and only bring charges uh, for seven of those uh, deaths of babies, not eight, um, which is very odd. No, no explanation's been given to that. But presumably, the judge himself thought that uh, she would be acquitted on one of those charges and then wouldn't... Uh, uh, be enough evidence to convict her. Um, even though all of the evidence was circumstantial, and all of it, including the things which sound scientific, which are, are based on some spurious opinions, I'll come back to that later. Just before the verdict also, one of the 12 jurors was mysteriously discharged. They'd sat through nine months of listening to evidence. The week before the verdicts were due to come out, one of the jurors just dis, you know was was discharged from the jury so you were left with only 11 rather than 12 and that's a very odd thing uh, to happen we're told and this is something that has been written in the media that there were 14 guilty verdicts against Lucy Leppy uh out of 24 charges so there were seven charges of murder and uh 17 charges of attempted murder um, and she had a, against her seven charges of seven convictions of murder, seven of attempted murder. They were not all unanimous. Only three of the verdicts were unanimous. Eleven of those fourteen verdicts were by a majority vote of the jury. Now, in a case like this, you start off by seeing who whether someone will be, will be convicted unanimously. If they're not convicted unanimously, the judge can choose whether to accept a majority verdict or not. And there's no rule, there's no consistency in this at all. It depends entirely on the judge on the day. You get one judge, he might accept a majority verdict. You get another judge, he might not. But the judge in this case accepted 11 majority verdicts, um, six for murder and uh, five for attempted murder. There were only three unanimous verdicts, one for murder and two for attempted murder. Um, a majority verdict in this case, there was 10 to 1. Um, there were six hung verdicts, hung juries, where, where there was no verdict, where there was you know more equal number of jurors for and against, and there were four not guilty verdicts. If the judge had decided not to accept majority verdicts, there would only have been three convictions, which immediately would bring into question the safety of those convictions, because um, if there were 24 charges and 21 of them didn't, you know, were not guilty or hung. Only three of them were unanimous. Well, then people would immediately say, well, what about these six babies that died? And what about the other charges of attempted murder? We haven't proved conclusively um, that she did it. So that opens the everything up to a retrial uh, and it opens up many, many questions about, well, if she was only guilty of one unanimously, one murder unanimously, what what about all the others? Because that still leaves a huge unexplained spike in the deaths of babies in the unit. So that's just something that's been presented to us, which isn't entirely true. Um, the majority of the, the guilty verdicts were by majority vote, not unanimous. Um, and another couple of very strange things about the case is one of the witnesses, um, apparently someone that uh, Lucy Letby had developed a, a special friendship with, an older married consultant, appeared in court behind a screen 
so that his identity could be um, kept secret. Why? Well, I mean, what's the purpose of this? As an older man, whatever, in his 50s, and he's actually someone that, uh, you know, it's debatable whether she had a relationship with him or not, or just a special friendship, but certainly some kind of deep emotional connection with, and he turned on her and uh, fed her to the wolves. But he had protection. His identity was protected, which is very, very strange um, for someone, you know, as, as a witness to be doing this. Why? And another very strange thing is that for the first time in hundreds of years, I think, of English legal history, the names of the victims are being protected and they are not being named. So after the, the case has happened and the judge has ruled that the victims, you know, according to the verdict, um, the babies that died, or, or, you know, had health crashes uh, and collapses and recovered, cannot be named. So through the trial, yes, they're called baby A, baby P, baby C. We've had that in other trials before. And at the end of them, the, the babies have been named. <clears throat> in this case, almost uniquely, I don't think, I can't remember any other case like this, where the judge says, you cannot name the victims. This is very odd and very strange um, and unusual. So there are some unusual anomalies about the case that make you question, well, you know, why are these things happening which are so abnormal and all happening in the same case here? Now, that's not proof that the, the, the verdicts are wrong. But I think if you actually look at some other things, that calls the verdict into question way, way more than just those things um, that I've said already. First is the dodgy spreadsheet. <clears throat> we were presented in the mainstream media with a spreadsheet that shows the 24 cases the police were investigating, seven of deaths and 17 of uh, health collapses from which th there was recovery. Um, and they, it shows that Lucy Letby was present at all of them. But this is not how you do science. This is absolute nonsense. All it shows is that Lucy Letby was present at 100% of the time where she was present. And I'm amazed that this spreadsheet could even be admitted as evidence and shown to the jury because immediately they'll look at it and they'll go, oh, wow, she was present 100% of the time. Therefore, you know, this is an open and shut case. But it's nonsense because there weren't just seven deaths. There were 17. There weren't just 17 health collapses. There were over 30. So if you had um, a spreadsheet, what it should have been presented was a spreadsheet showing all of the 17 deaths and all of the health collapses over that period. That would have shown conclusively that she wasn't present all of the time. She was only present maybe 50% of the time. So you had something like this with, you know, this is just for deaths, the 17 deaths of babies, and it, it would show, okay, she was present at eight of them, uh, and alongside other nurses, you know, I, I don't know the names of the nurses, but they would have been present sometime and some, some you know, sometimes not. This would actually be a visual um thing a visual cue to the jury to show well look, there is no conclusive proof here that all of the deaths and all of the health collapses were due to her and, and i'm amazed that the defense didn't challenge this and didn't present their own counter spreadsheet like this that showed that she wasn't present all of the time. Because once the jury see a visual that shows that she was present all of the time, even though she wasn't, it's a deception. They got it in their mind. Ah, open and shut case. She was there 100% of the times when something happened to a baby. When she wasn't. And this was not challenged and it's been presented to us in the public, in the general, uh, by the mainstream media as well. It's been presented to the general public by the mainstream media as well, I mean. Um, so this is clearly um, something that 
how on earth could this even be admitted as evidence when it deceives you into uh, not seeing that she wasn't present all of the time <clears throat> when something happened to a baby in the unit? The key witness for the prosecution was Dewey Evans, who presented himself as an expert when he wasn't actually an expert in neonatal care. And he said, for all of the things that happened, I theorise, I think that it may have been this. The autopsy said one thing, and in the case of the seven babies that died, there were six autopsies. One of them wasn't actually autopsied and given a post-mortem. But this prosecution witness came in and said, oh, I don't believe the autopsy. I think this may have been caused by this and Lucy Letby may have done it. Why on earth was that not questioned? Because that is so spurious and circumstantial. And to me, it doesn't... It doesn't stack up scientifically at all in any way. And the easiest thing to do to rebut that would be to say, OK, well, you think you have this theory. Well, it may or may not be true, but there's this theory and there's that theory and there's the other theory that may also explain it. And also, we need to look at all of the other 10 deaths of the babies in the unit and see if you could say the same thing about them. And if you could, that would immediately exonerate her because it would, there would not be um, a conclusive pattern there. But because they weren't looking at all 17 deaths in the trial, they were only narrowing it down to the seven. And then you have this, this witness who may or may not have been paid um, as a paid consultant. That's another question. And to give evidence, he went to the police and offered his services as a witness. Uh, whether he was paid for that or not, we don't know. Um, but you can make your own minds up about that. Um, why? Scientifically, you see, scientifically, if you want to prove something on this kind of circumstantial evidence, you would need to do a blind trial of all 17 cases and perhaps add in more control cases as well. There's no comparison, you see. So you cannot make any conclusion which you know has any veracity in this kind of case scientifically by just going, oh, there's these seven cases. I think this is a theory. It's not even a conclusion. It's a theory. You need to apply that theory, okay, that the, the autopsy was wrong and the death was caused by an air embolism, right? That's basically what his theory was. Maybe true, maybe not. Probably unlikely, and there's no way of actually proving that after the, the autopsy has been done. The autopsy didn't say that, but he comes along years later and says that. Unless you look at all of the cases and you apply the theory to all 17 cases, blind. What I mean by blind is not physically blind, but scientifically blind, in that you don't know which of the 17 cases Lucy Letby was present and which she wasn't. You don't tell the person uh, testing the theory. Then they have to, if what the, they come up with then correlates with the times that she was present, okay, then that is more that stronger evidence that she actually um, was involved. But if they cannot do that and they suggest, OK, there's a theory here that in some of the 17 cases there was an air embolism, the autopsy was wrong. You get someone to look at the autopsy results blind and say, OK, well, I think perhaps in this one, in this one, in this one, there was an air embolism without telling them which ones she was present in and which ones she wasn't. If they point um, entirely to when she was present, fair enough. That would be enough to convince me more that she was guilty. But if they look at all of them and then they say, oh, well, this one, this one, this one, this one could have been by an air embolism and some of them were the cases where she was there and some of them were the cases where she wasn't there, 
that would immediately exonerate her. There would be no question that, you know, the evidence, the theory that given by this Dewey Evans guy was completely spurious. But that wasn't done and that wasn't presented to the jury and that wasn't presented. It's not being presented um, to the public now in her second almost public trial by media to convince everybody of the veracity of the verdict. The verdicts. Um, uh, this evidence is not being presented. But you see, you cannot do science in this way. If you have a theory, you have to have a control, a comparison to actually show that your theory is correct. So you have to look at all 17 to test the theory, not just the seven, because this immediately introduces um, bias. And of course, the prosecution, the police, the prosecution are wanting a conviction. Um, so there you have the dodgy evidence, as I would call it. The defence as well seems to be so weak. And there have been some people who were in the trial looking at it. Some people would say, well, asking the same question, why on earth did they not question the spreadsheet? Why on earth did they not question this evidence given by Dewey Evans? Why on earth did they not question the other bit of evidence that sounds a little bit more scientific, even though it still is circumstantial, which was um, the, the two cases of a high level of insulin. They, they, they just accepted it. Why, why on earth are you not questioning this <coughs> and bringing in your own scientific experts to do what I've said, to look at all the cases blind scientifically to show that um, you cannot correlate the idea of an air embolism which contradicts the autopsy uh, in all of the cases. The only, uh, the only witness they called forward was the plumber. No scientific witnesses whatsoever. Now, to me, that looks, you know, like ineptitude. But there is someone saying, you know, a couple of people are saying something that sounds a little bit more sinister even, is that they're saying it look, someone said who was at the trial, it looks like their hands were tied. And I wonder, and you know, this is not provable, but it may be that the judge directed them not to talk about the other 10 cases uh, where a baby died and Lucy Letby wasn't present. Sorry, the nine cases. Obviously, there was one where she was present, but it was uh, the charges were dropped. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not. But if it is the case that the defence were directed not to defend her on the basis of comparing the evidence on these cases against the cases where she wasn't present that could have exonerated her, then this is a miscarriage of justice. Simple as that. Again, that's something I don't know, but it's something that is a possibility. And it's very, very concerning. So the conclusion of this is that, personally, I, th I have very, very serious concerns about this case and again, this is a very, very similar case to that of Lucia de Burke uh, in the Netherlands, who was convicted of the murder of seven babies in, in a hospital in the Netherlands in, in 20, sorry, 2003, and uh, entirely on circumstantial evidence, as in this case of Lucy Letby, it's all on circumstantial evidence. There is no direct evidence at all that she has done anything to cause the deaths or the health collapses of the babies uh, in that neonatal unit. Uh, I think that this needs a retrial. And the retrial needs to take into account all of the scientific evidence which is presented on the Rex Lucy Letby 2023 site, the um, Science on Trial site. And uh, the defence needs to make a better job of it and to 
question the uh, evidence and to look at the autopsies and in all of the 17 cases of babies dying, all of the 30 plus collapses, not just the ones the police and the prosecution wanted to be talked about at the trial, but all of them, so that they can compare the evidence that's being presented by the prosecution with evidence that they need to get their own scientific experts um, to look at the other cases and also to question the dodgy spreadsheet, which very really is dodgy, and to um, to make sure that uh, all of the evidence uh, is presented here and also to make sure that everyone understands that this cluster of deaths happened at the time it correlates to the time where the unit was upgraded and also this is why they had the plumber in as a, as a witness that the sewage system they put a new sewage system in to cope with the extra uh, number of very you know poorly sickly premature babies often that were coming there the sewage system was directly above the ceiling where the cots of the babies were situated and sewage was leaking. So the things, the, 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 the deaths and the health events, uh, the, the crashes, the health crashes that some of the babies had could easily have been caused by bacteria from the leaking sewage which was directly above where the babies were and that was one piece of evidence which i think the 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 need more attention needs to be paid to because some of the pathogens that you could be you you don't put babies near raw sewage leaks it's just really ridiculous you're gonna have um adverse health events there and and of course perhaps sadly deaths happening and um the science on trial website actually you know does very very uh, you know look very very much look into this and um <clears throat> shows how uh pathogens from bacteria uh from sewage leaks in close proximity to premature babies uh, can easily have caused all of the uh, incidents that happened uh, which were mentioned in the trial. So the inquiry is going on, but I don't think that's enough. I think there needs to be a retrial on this and all of the evidence needs to be heard, not just evidence for the prosecution and no science coming from the defence. That's very bizarre that the science, the, the, the defense didn't present any scientific experts. And I wonder, this is very disturbing, you know, as a scientist, why they didn't do this. I don't know what the reason for this is, but I certainly fear this is a miscarriage of justice. And um, this needs to be continually challenged, uh, like in the case of Lucia de Burke in the Netherlands and by it being continually challenged over and over again, there was another trial, a retrial, and she was exonerated. Someone convicted entirely on circumstantial evidence in prison for seven years and then exonerated. She shouldn't have been in prison at all. I fear this is the case with Lucy Letby. Please let me know what you think um, about all of these things. Do have a look at the site, Science on Trial. Uh, do have a look at the interview um between norman fenton and steve mclaughlin who's very good uh interview um uh, discussing all of these things as well i'll put links to them below thanks for listening if you got to the end and um thank you for all your comments uh about the last video that i made i think this is a very very important case to keep discussing and to keep um challenging the mainstream narrative on